In this presentation, we will introduce concepts related to correlation. Please note that the material covered is actually drawn from section 8.1 of the alternate textbook reading that I had assigned. In chapter 8, we are moving away from consideration of single variable data sets and inferential statistics techniques to briefly look at so-called bivariate, that is, two variable data. At the heart of looking at visual displays of bivariate data is the scatter plot, which we first looked at in chapter two of our text. We will define the form of a linear model, explore criteria that makes a good linear model fit, and introduce a new statistic called correlation. In chapter two, we discuss scatter plots, which can be used to determine if there is an association or correlation between two variables. Here's some related terminology. When we have a scatter plot that tightly follows a line or a curve, we say that there is a strong relationship. When we have a scatter plot that goes up from left to right, we call that a positive relationship. If the scatter plot goes down from left to right, we call that a negative relationship. Two variables are linearly related if the scatter plot reveals a pattern that follows a straight line. An association exists between two variables when they are related in some way. And then correspondingly, we say that a correlation exists between two variables when they are linearly related. Let's now apply the terminology that we looked at on the prior slide to some examples from the alternate textbook section 8.1. Taking a look at the first scatter plot that you see on the slide, we would say that that relationship is strong. There is definitely a distinct pattern to the dots. We would say it is negative because the dots go downward from left to right. We would say the pattern is linear, and we would say that they, dis, uh, they display a correlation because there is a strong linear pattern to the dots. In this second example, we would say that the relationship is definitely strong. There is a definite pattern to the dots. We would say that it is positive because the dots tend to go upward from left to right. It is nonlinear because the dots don't form a straight line. And in this case, we would say it is an association because there is not a linear, linear relationship displayed by the dots. Moving on to our third scatter plot example, looking at the pattern that is formed, we would probably say the relationship is somewhat strong. Uh, we would definitely say that it is negative. The pattern of the dots is going downward from left to right. Uh, we would say it's somewhat linear. Uh, possibly bordering on being a little bit nonlinear. And in this case, we would say there is a correlation because the pattern is somewhat linear. So we would, in this case, pick correlation as opposed to association. In this fourth and final scatter plot example, we would probably characterize this relationship as weak. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to determine if it's positive or negative. I would, I would probably say uh, I cannot tell. As to it being linear, the answer is no, it's nonlinear. And as to it being an association or a correlation, we would probably say in this case, there's only an association because of the nonlinearity of the pattern formed by the dots. Now, from the previous examples, you probably saw that relying on scatter plots alone as a way of determining whether it exhibits a weak or strong linear or nonlinear association or correlation relationship can be a bit tricky. So the question might come up, is there a way that we can numerically evaluate scatter plot relationship characteristics so that we aren't guessing quite as much as we were on some of those scatter plots? The answer is yes. We use what is known as the linear correlation coefficient, R, which measures the direction and strength of the linear relationship between paired X and Y quantitative values in a sample. Let's now consider some properties for the linear correlation coefficient. First of all, the values for that range between negative one and one inclusive. In fact, the closer that the linear correlation coefficient is to positive one, the stronger the positive linear relationship. The closer it is to negative one, the stronger the negative re linear relationship between the two variables. The closer it is to zero, the weaker the linear relationship. And if the linear correlation coefficient is equal to zero, then there is no linear relationship between the two variables. The next thing to consider is that the value of the linear correlation coefficient doesn't change when our two variables are converted to a different scale. That is, if I use different units for the variables, that doesn't change the value of R. 
And then the last thing to note is that the value of r isn't affected by which variable I choose as my x or explanatory variable or y, that is my response variable. On this slide, I've reproduced some examples of the linear correlation coefficient values for different scatter plots. Here you can see this is perfectly lined up in the upper left hand corner, so therefore it has a correlation coefficient of positive one here going downward perfect straight line, so negative one. Here in this next one that my cursor is on, it's a fairly loose correlation, somewhat linear, so the correlation coefficient is a little smaller than the perfectly lined up one. And then here in this bottom one, still somewhat positive, but we can see that the linearity of the points is starting to decrease. And then in this, this second column of scatter plots, we see again, it's linear still, but not quite as linear as the top one was. And here at the bottom, it's getting less linear again. On the far right, we have a set of dots, a scatter plot in which the linear correlation coefficient is zero. We can see that there is no linearity to those at all. And here we can see that although the dots form a very distinct parabola pattern, uh, they have a very small linear correlation coefficient associated with them. Well, by now you should be thinking, this is great. Now that we have a numerical way of being able to tell whether a scatter plot is exhibiting a linear relationship in the dots, the question should be coming up, well, how do we calculate that value? Well, it turns out there is a formula for calculating the correlation coefficient, which is covered, covered in our textbook as well as the alternate textbook reading that was assigned. However, rather than using a formula, in this class we will either use rguru to find a correlation coefficient for bivariate data, or I will provide the correlation coefficient to you. So the next question we need to address is, when is a linear correlation coefficient significant? In this course, if the absolute value of the correlation coefficient r is larger than the critical values presented in table four of the alternate textbook for your sample size, then the linear correlation is significant. Now, if your sample size is not listed in table four, then you would use the closest smaller value. Lastly, I need to mention that in general, we would use a software program such as our guru to find a P or probability value for the correlation coefficient R. And that is exactly what we have done when we have run a hypothesis test. So that gives us a clue that to determine if a correlation coefficient is significant, there is a hypothesis test behind it. Usually a P or probability value less than 5% is considered significant. So let's look at some examples from the alternate textbook section 8.1 reading assignment to see if we can determine whether or not two variables have a significant linear correlation. So in this particular case, when correlating car weight and fuel economy, we find that the correlation coefficient from a sample of seven cars was negative 944 thousandths. So we go to table four in the alternate textbook we look for the line that corresponds to a sample size of seven cars, and we see that the critical value is 754 thousandths. Because the absolute value of our correlation coefficient from the sample is larger than the critical value, we would say there is a significant linear correlation between the two variables. In our second example, when correlating mother's and daughter's heights, we find that the correlation coefficient from a sample of eight pairs of mothers and daughters resulted in a correlation coefficient of 693 thousandths. So again, we go to table four in the alternate textbook. We look for the line that has a sample size of eight and we see that the critical value is 707 thousandths. Since our sample value is less than the critical value, we would in this case say that there is not a significant linear correlation between mother's and daughter's heights. However, what if we had 20 pairs in the sample that resulted in the same correlation value of 693 thousandths? Well, going to the line in the, in the table where there are 20 in the sample, we see that the new critical value is 444 thousandths. 
Now, because our sample linear correlation coefficient is larger than the critical value, we would say that there is a significant linear correlation between mother's and daughter's heights in this case. I now just want to go ahead and mention two further correlation considerations, the first of which is outliers. These are data values that can sometimes make or break linear correlations. This topic is discussed in section 8.3 of our textbook and section 8.1 of the alternate text reading assignment. I'm not going to dwell on this topic any further. The second one is interpreting the linear correlation coefficient using what is called explained variation. This is discussed in section 8.2.7 of our textbook and section 8.1 of the alternate text reading assignment. And again, I'm not going to dwell on this particular topic. As we start to close our presentation, I want to take a brief look at some issues with correlation, causation, and lurking variables. First of all, don't say correlation when you mean association. The word correlation indicates the strength of a linear relationship, whereas the term association is deliberately vague and can apply to any scatter plot or any relationship between two variables. Correlation versus causation. There are three things I want to mention in this regard. First of all, scatter plots and correlations never prove causation by themselves. Secondly, always be on the lookout for what are known as lurking variables. Those are variables that are not included in the scatter plot, but that may be causing the two variables to rise or fall together. And then thirdly, while a correlation doesn't prove causation between two variables, it does provide evidence that there is some type of causal relationship that is happening. So we're going to close our presentation by looking at some examples from the section 8.1 alternate textbook reading. In the first example, we are told that there is a significant correlation between the price of rum and the salaries of statistics professors. Does one cause the other? Well, we certainly wouldn't think so. So what might be the lurking variable? In this case, the lurking variable is either inflation, that explains why they would both go up, or deflation, that would explain why they both go down together. In our second example, we are told there is a strong correlation between ice cream sales and deaths by drowning. Does ice cream sales cause drowning? Well, we certainly wouldn't think so. So what might be the lurking variable? Well, in this case, the lurking variable is obviously seen to be the outside temperature. When that goes up, both ice cream sales and deaths by drowning both go, go upwards. And when the temperature drops, both of those things drop correspondingly. So for our third example, we note that there is a significant correlation between the rate of cricket chirps and temperature. Does this prove that increased temperature causes crickets to chirp faster? And the answer is no, it doesn't necessarily prove it. Correlation is not the same as causation, though we do strongly suspect that increased temperature is behind why the crickets are chirping faster. Uh, the second question is, is it possible the faster chirping causes the temperature to rise? And that one we know is foolish. We know that just because crickets are chirping faster, that doesn't have an effect on the temperature. Could there be a lurking variable? Uh, yeah, it could be maybe it's the mating season. It could be a variety of other factors that we're just not aware of we would probably need to perform some sort of experiment to show that temperature is the key variable that is causing the increase in cricket chirps. Okay, for our last example, there is a positive correlation between the amount of rat poison in a house and the number of rats in the area. Does more rat poison increase rat populations? And we know that that's very foolish. Um, if, if anything, the cause and effect relationship is probably in the other direction. In other words, as rat populations are increasing, people go out and buy more rat poison, and so that causes an increase in the amount of rat poison. And that completes this presentation.